الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي إليه مصائر الخلق وواقب الأمر نحمده ونعزيم إحسانه ونير برهانه ونوام فضل امتنانه حمدا يكون لعبده قضاء ولشكره عداء ولا صوابه موجبا ولحسن مزيده مقربا الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبي شفي المذنبين راهدا للعاشقين والمراد المشتاقين شمس العارفين والسراج الصالحين نبي السلطان والعلم صاحب الجود والكرم والله عاصمه وجبرائيل خادمه والمراق مرقبه سدرة المنتهى مقامه كعب قوسين محبوب رب المشرقين والمغربين جد الحسن والحسين مولانا ومولاي التقلين أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على جميع أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين المنتخبين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ولعنة الدائمة على دائم منكر فزائلهم غاصب حقوقهم ومراتبهم ومنزلتهم ومكامهم من يومنا هذا إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في قرانه الكريم وهو أصدق القائلين قوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات I know we don't have a lot of time, but before I begin, I'm sure you guys won't mind if I take a moment just to appreciate this much this here, what we're doing here today. Because once upon a time, used to be my dad, we'd sit up here, or it'd be my dad, he'd be standing there, reading Jumar Anwar's. Some of you are older, might remember it. Some of you have been in Ozaim for a little longer, might remember it. And I'd be sitting down here with you guys. And after the majlis, we'd go upstairs, we'd run around, we'd play, we'd fight. I still remember from the very beginning with our time when we were in a little house. We had that one house just to ourselves. And when we went there, when we first moved into that house, the grass was about this high. I had to go and cut that with my dad and all the guys from the guy came down. Cut the grass and did everything there. Then we moved on into a church hall. It was a nice little church hall, but then the community grew bigger still. Then we moved over to Langley where we had the first floor. And over there, and we used to play football more than anything. We had our summer camps and Easter camps and things like that there, where we'd come down and we'd have fights with the boys from Newport and from Peterborough and from all over. And then we had this building here, the community grew even bigger. And now, by the time missions got to a point, it's gotten to a stage where even this building is too small for the community. And when you see where we started and where we've come, it's really incredible. But if I think back on my time in our time, just purely happy memories. Running around, play fighting, wrestling, playing football. All in these same halls. In here, when there's nothing going on, in here after the mudges, we go upstairs. I remember once we were wrestling upstairs, play fighting. I think it was either Rehan or Farhan. One of those two got really badly hurt. And we all ran away, and one by one, Hajin Sarak came and pulled us all together, shouted us all, told us all off. But even still, they were all happy memories, brilliant memories ones that I wouldn't change for anything. 
But in all of that, we grew up. We grew older, we got responsibilities. We started to have to worry about things. Things started to stress us out. School, work, we have deadlines, we have to be social, we have to meet our friends, we have to go out. But at the same time, we have to get our work done for school, we have to get our coursework done, our assignments done. At the same time, we have to make sure we're getting enough sleep. At some point, in all that play fighting, and all that playing football, and all that wrestling, at some point, we all had to grow up. We all had to face the real world, face life, see what's really in front of us. And as we grew older, these worries and these stresses, they start to take over. Before, we'd worry about little things. We'd stress about things that are small. Things that we don't really need to worry too much about as a child. Me, from the beginning, from birth really, because my family, I've been a very big Arsenal support. So most of my stress as a kid was all due to Arsenal. A lot of my stress still is, but when I was a child, I used to worry about things like that. I used to worry about not getting my homework done on time and getting attention. But then as you grow older, those worries and those stresses, <coughs> they start to build up. It might be the same stuff. It might be the same things that stress you out. Arsenal still stresses me out. I'm in university. I still worry about my deadlines, getting my work done on time. It's the same stresses, but they build up. And other things start to worry us. Other things start to stress us out. We have other things on our mind. And when we have all these things on our mind, when we have all this stuff that we're going through, we often try to look to somewhere to help us. We often try to find something to drag us out of this hole, drag us out of this state of drowning within all our worries and our stresses. I think it was about two years ago now. I was at one of the summer camps from Bamaj Kholobar. And I was in a little kayak. We were in a lake. And my kayak tipped over. And the very first thing I did was I tried to find something to hold onto so that I don't drown. I had a life vest on, but even still, when you fall into the water, you look for something, you try to grab hold of something. You can't grab hold of the water because it slips through your hands. You can't grab hold onto someone else because they'll fall into the water too. I tried to grab hold onto my boat and the boat went under the water as well. I was looking for something to find, something to hold, and I couldn't find anything. After a little while, I stopped thrashing about. I managed to get hold onto one of the boats properly, and I managed to hold myself up. I had the life vest on anyway, and I know how to swim. It wasn't a worrying situation, but when you fall into the water, when you think you're about to drown, you get worried. In the same way, with all these worries, all these stresses, they start to build up. They start to come at you, and they start to come harder, and they start to come faster. We try and look for something, something to hold on to. Where can I turn to? What can I do? And when we don't find anything, when we can't see anything, that's when we have to realize that life jacket that we're wearing, that power that's within us to deal with these problems and these stresses and these issues, that's where we realize how we have to use them. That's when we understand how we have to take hold of that. Now, when we look at what we are, who we are, you can ask me who I am, and there's a lot of things I can tell you. First of all, I'll tell you my name. I might tell you where I'm from, I'm from Pakistan, grew up in South London. I might tell you which mosque I go to, I go to Adara Jafia. I might tell you what I'm doing in life, I'm studying in Hawza, in Iran. But above all of that, who am I? What comes first to me? It's that I'm a Muslim. It's the most important thing to me. So then, Islam should help me with all these things. If being a Muslim is the most important thing in my life, if being part of the religion of Islam is the thing that defines me most, then everything I do should be according to Islam. And when we go through these worries and stresses in life, when we go through this anxiety in life, when we have these thoughts that seemingly drag us down, we should be able to turn to Islam. The way we react to them, the way we deal with them, should also be in accordance with Islam. And so I want to speak in these 12 or so days about taking care of ourselves and how Islam helps us with that. Helps us with our mental health. How does Islam take care of us? 
Folks are always told we're the ambassadors of Islam. We have to take the image of Islam out there. We have to show people how great Islam is. But how does Islam take care of us? And that's what we'll be looking at over the next few days. How, is, how Islam is helping me through all these issues. Now, it's a little known fact that before Muharram, a large group of the Mulanas, the ulama, and the Mubalibi, the speakers, they gather, they gather together, and they discuss what the important topics are. They discuss what needs to be spoken about in Muharram. And until this year, this issue of our mental health, of taking care of ourselves, has not really come up. It's been mentioned, but nobody's put any weight on it. Nobody's given it importance. This year, inshallah, and in the years to come, we'll start to look at these things. We'll start to look at them more. But in our time, this year, we'll spend a lot of time focused on it. In these 12 days, we'll look very closely at our mental health, what it is, what are we talking about, how it can deteriorate, how it can get better, and the role of Islam in all this. How Islam can actually help us in these kind of matters. These things that aren't really spoken about, these things that aren't really heard of, how can Islam help us with these? Recite aloud, Salawat. Now, first, we have to understand what it is we're talking about mental health. What is it? In the same way somebody can be physically healthy or unhealthy, how do we understand whether someone's healthy or unhealthy? We look at how their body, body is doing its job, how their organs are working, how their blood pressure is, how high or low it is. We look at how their body is doing what it's meant to be doing, protecting them from outside threats and viruses, bacteria and what. The very same way, your mental health is what your mind is doing. How is your mind functioning? Is it functioning the way it's meant to or not? What kind of thoughts are going through your mind? What kinds of things do you understand? But the, the difficult thing is here, when we're talking about the mind, it's something that we haven't quite fully understood yet. And it's something very difficult to understand as well. It's something that'll take a lot to figure out. We all have different ideas about what our mind is, where our mind is, what does our mind do, how does it work? How is our mind connected to our body? How does it relate to our body? I'll give you a small example of what we know about the mind. If you think of a fridge, every time I touch a fridge, I don't get an electric shock. Why? Because the fridge itself isn't electricity. But the fridge needs electricity to run. Electricity is com something completely separate which is connected to that fridge. Yeah? And in the same way, that electricity is our mind. That fridge is our body. It's doing what it does. It's running our bodily organs, it's running our bodily functions. And the electricity, the mind, is supplying that body. It's got a connection with the body whereby the electricity doesn't need the fridge. But the fridge needs the electricity. Same way your mind doesn't need your body, but your body needs your mind. How do we know this? Now I'm Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. He says, take note of this point, it's a beautiful point. He says that 2,000 years before the creation of our physical bodies, Allah Azza wa Jal created unity between the brothers. He created brotherhood and friendship between the souls, between the minds. Now what does this mean? There's two points to take from this. First of all, just a side point, just from this very one thing. If you have a friend, if you have a brother, someone who you are close with, take care of them. Stay close with them as well as you can. In that very same hadith, the Imam goes on to say that if in that realm, in that world, 2,000 years before the creation of your body, if in that world you became friends with somebody, you had that brotherhood between your souls and your minds, then in this world you'll be able to create that same bond, that same friendship, that same brotherhood. And if in that world you're unable to, then in this world you will not be able to become friends with that person. You don't have that brotherhood and that friendship with that particular person. So if you look around you at the friends you have with you, Look around you at the people that are around you. These aren't just friends you met in school. The true friends I'm talking about. The people who are really your friends. These aren't just people you met in school or you met at work. It's not just a guy you met at football, somebody you grew close with. No. This is somebody who all those years ago, 
when Allah Azza wa Jal in that world created the brotherhood between the souls and the minds, at that point, there was a connection between your soul and the soul of your friend, between your mind and the mind of your friend. So if ever you're in an argument with your friend, if ever you fall out with your friend, make sure you fix that. Make sure you patch things up. Take care of your friends. Whenever they need your help, take care of them. But that's just another side point based on the hadith that we're speaking about. The real thing to notice here is that Allah, the Imam is telling us that Allah Azza wa Jal created this non-physical part of us, our mind, our soul. He created it long, long before our physical bodies. They're connected, but they're separate. The soul does not need the body to exist. But when do we come to life? When that soul, when that mind is connected to our body. That's when we come to life. So the body does need the mind, it does need the soul. Now, the mind itself, this is a connection it has with the body, but the reason that we find it difficult to understand what the mind is, to understand what it does, is because what we understand of the mind is that it's a thinking thing. Our mind is what does our thinking for us, our understanding for us. So when we have to think about the mind, what we're really doing is we're using the mind to understand itself. And to make it a bit easier to understand why that's difficult. I'm not sure how true it is, but it's a fact that most of you might have seen. That apparently when we look in the mirror, we see ourselves as like five, ten times more attractive than we actually are. Now we're looking at ourselves. We're right there, in the mirror. But we still don't have full recognition of what we're looking at, of ourselves, of our own body. I'll give you another example. I think it was about five years ago, four or five years ago roughly. I was playing football and I snapped a ligament in my ankle. Doctor told me after two months, then you can start to lightly exercise that ankle. Then you can start to go back to playing light football with your friends, a small kickabout. Nothing too intense. I said two months. After about one month, I still remember it, I was running up the stairs in my house and I thought to myself, you know, my ankle is it's feeling strong. I feel like I'm ready to go back to play football. I tested it out, out of it, I thought, you know what, I'm ready. And that, I think it was that same day. I messaged my friend and I said, look, tomorrow I'm coming to football. He said, no, Zach, you're not ready. The doctor told you two months and then you start. It's only been one. I said, no, I, I know my body. I'm ready. I can feel it. My ankle's ready. I played for about 10 minutes and then someone tackled me, heard the same snap, rolling around on the floor again, and three months I was out this time. I still remember that year in the Zayn Abiyah tournament that we always played. I think that was the first year so that I beat my team in football. And I'm going to say that was because of the ankle. But what we have to understand is, if our body can't understand itself, my body didn't realize it was still weak. The ankle wasn't ready. My ankle wasn't healed properly. My body didn't understand itself. It didn't recognize itself. The mind is something much more complicated than the body. It's something much more difficult to understand. So if we have to ask the mind to try and understand itself, we're asking a very great task. But there are some things which we've understood. There are some things which we've been able to look at, which we've been able to see and think, okay, this is our mind, this is how it works, this is how it should be, this is how it shouldn't be. So what is mental health? What is the health of our mind? Same way we said that the body, when it's unhealthy, it's not performing its functions. The organs aren't doing what they're meant to be doing. Your blood isn't flowing the way it's meant to be flowing. The same way the mind, one of the indicators of whether your mind is healthy, whether your mind is strong, is the way the mind works. What do you understand the job of the mind to be? To think and to understand. So when our thoughts are not in line with what they should be, when we're not thinking the way we should be thinking, when we're not feeling the way we should be feeling, when I see something around me and I don't understand it the way it's meant to be understood, that's when I can start to think, maybe. Maybe I need to give my mind a little refresh. Maybe I need to give my mind a little reboot. But then sometimes these problems become greater. They become more difficult to handle. A small refresh, a small reboot, it won't be enough. But how do we know when our thoughts aren't working the way they're meant to be working? How do we know when our mind isn't doing what it's meant to be doing? What are those thoughts that aren't the thoughts that we're meant to be having? When we think about what thoughts we're meant to be having, 
our thoughts. What are they really? They're just our mind talking to ourselves. And when we talk to ourselves, these thoughts, these feelings, they should be constructive. They should be helping me. They should be working for me. After all, I want the best for myself. Everyone wants the best for themselves, so what do they do? They do that which is best for themselves. But when the mind starts telling you things that make you think other than that which is best for yourself, when the mind starts telling you you're not good enough, when it starts telling you you need to be better, you need to be more like that person, you need to be more like this, you need to change, you're not good enough, these are the kind of thoughts that are destructive. The kind of thoughts that aren't good for me, they aren't healthy. Of course, if I see somebody and I think they have a good attribute, there's something good about them. For instance, somebody who's always on time somewhere. Or look at somebody who's better than me at football, and I think I want to be like him. I want to try and make myself better. That's constructive. But when those thoughts are framed in the way that I'm not good enough, and I can't be as good as him, that's when these thoughts start becoming destructive. When these thoughts aren't working for us anymore, when these thoughts are damaging to us, that's when we can see our mental health is going on a path which is towards unhealthiness. It's towards a lack of health. And when we start to lose control over those thoughts, when we start to lose control over what we're thinking, what we're feeling, that's when we can see ourselves going down a path of psychological and emotional lack of well-being. That's when we start to have to look, that's when we have to start looking at ourselves and thinking to ourselves, what can I do to change this? To get back to a point of psychological well-being, to a point where I'm healthy again in my mind. The same way we have with our body, how can I get my mind healthy again? And when we look at what we said at the start, that we should find these solutions in Islam, that Islam should be able to take care of us, Islam can. Islam does take care of us. But we have to find those solutions, and those solutions are there. Now, it says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Al Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, and we sent the Quran down <coughs> from that which is a healing and a mercy for the believers. So, what does this mean? What is Allah Azza wa Jal telling us? This is Allah Azza wa Jal in His own words, in His own book, in the Quran, telling us that this Quran, this book that you read, it within itself has cure, has a cure for all your struggles, all your problems, all your issues. They're in the Quran, the answer to them. Now, I'm not denying the power of the Quran. There are verses in the Quran which alone can help you through any difficulty, through any struggle. There are du'as which can help you through any difficulty and any struggle. But Allah Azza wa has also given us physical solutions actual actions that we can do, things that we can do to keep ourselves healthy, to take care of ourselves. We'll be looking at those over the next few days. It's a very commonly understood thing. I can recite Rabbi Zidni Ilma all I want. Before my exam, I can recite Rabbi Yasser wa Rad Asr wa Bil Khair all I want to help with my nerves, to help me with my exams. I can do all the du'as I want for Allah Azza wa Jal to help me through my exams. But if I don't revise, will I do well in my exams? If I don't study, will I get through those lessons? Will I get through those exams? No. Why? Allah Azza wa has given us means. He's given us ways to get these du'as accepted. He's given us ways to help ourselves. There's a story, it's a fictional story of a fisherman who was out at sea. A storm came and his ship capsized. He managed to find a tree and hold on to it in the sea. Or he managed to find something to hold on to in the sea. He was hold on, holding on to it, and this man who had great faith that Allah Azza wa Jal will save him. So, a fisher, another fisherman's boat comes past. A fisherman's fishing boat comes past, and it says to the guy, Come, come on board, I'll take you back to shore. The man says, No, no, Allah will save you. They argue, they try, the man tries to convince him to come on board, but the fisherman will not accept. The boat goes. A second boat, slightly, slightly larger, comes. It says to the man, Come aboard, we'll save you, we'll take you. The fisherman says, no. My Lord will save me, Allah will save me. This boat goes as well. A third boat comes, the same conversation, the same outcome. The man stays there. After a few days at sea, the man passes away. 
Here it is happening, he complains to Allah Azza wa Jalla. He says, Allah Azza wa Jalla, I was waiting for you to save me and you did not send me anything. If you did not save me from the water, she replied, surely then would come from Allah Azza wa Jalla. I sent you three ships and you took none of them. We have to understand and look around ourselves. Allah Azza wa Jalla has given us those tools. We have to take them. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has given us what we need. We just have to take hold. The solutions are there. We'll be looking at those over the next few days. Over the next 12 days, inshallah, we'll be looking in depth at the different psychological issues and struggles that we can go through and the solutions that Islam gives us. And just a small word on why it's important. It's something that's neglected a lot, like we said at the start. But why is this so important? What is this mental health issue? Why do we have to look at it? How many of you here right now are aged between the ages of 5 and 16? Just from a raise of hands, how many of you are aged between 5 and 16? It's the majority of people in this room. According to Mind.org, which is a charity who works for these kind of issues, mental health issues, one in 25 young people aged between 5 and 16 have reported being clinically stressed or suffering from clinical anxiety. That's 5 to 16. Look at these boundaries. Age 5 years old, when we don't understand most things around the world, about the world around us. Age 16. 16 is a very big age. You're starting your A-levels. You're going into the real world now. You're more independent. This is the start of your life. And before your life has started, one in 25 young people have reported. So this isn't just the people who suffer. This is just the people who have reported it, who've gone to a doctor and said, I have these issues, and the doctor has told them. Clinically, you're suffering from anxiety and stress. And these aren't just feelings of stress. This isn't just an emotion that, of anxiety that comes over me, that I feel anxious. No. These are talking about the clinical state of anxiety, where it gets to a point where it has an effect on your physical body, where you become ill. <coughs> This is 1 in 25 people aged 5 to 16. And another statistic. Amongst children, young people, aged 10 to 19. How many of you here are aged 10 to 19? Just from a show of hands? Again, the majority of the room. The second biggest cause of death amongst people aged 10 to 19 is suicide. And when do we commit suicide? When does somebody commit suicide? When the problems of this world become so much that they see no other way out. At age 19, you're beginning your life. At age 10, you haven't even begun to begin your life. If we actually look at these figures, they're nothing short of frightening. And it's an issue that we have to face. It's an issue that we have to look at and we have to understand. Because we can't let more and more members of our community become statistics. We can't let more and more of our families and friends just become figures in these databases, just numbers, no. We have to take care of those people around us. We have to look out for the people around us. Amongst those of you here today, there may be some of you who struggle with the issues that we're talking about. There may be some of you who do not struggle with the issues which we are talking about. See, here's the thing about these majalis. You come here every year, and for instance, if Maulana's talking about namaz, he's talking about salah. We assume that everyone sitting here prays their namaz and they pray it on time. If that's the case, then does this majlis about namaz have anything to do with the people sitting there? Is it worth it for them to listen to? It is. Because these majlises don't just stop here. The point of this majlis is for you to then go out. When you're talking to your friends, when you're talking to your family, the people around you, what you learn in these majlises to apply it, to use it there, to teach other people, to help other people. That's for namaz. This is for taking care of ourselves, taking care of the people around us. This is a matter and an issue which, and I can almost guarantee, every single person in this room, whether you know it or not, you know somebody struggling with these issues. You know somebody going through these struggles. They could have the biggest smile on their face and the heaviest heart. They could have the best personality. They could be the most social person and struggle from social anxiety. 
you might not know it, but there's people around you who are struggling. So even if you're not suffering from the issues that we're talking about, and inshallah you won't be, but if you are not, then listen carefully to what we're talking about and use that around you. Use it to help those around you. And in these coming days, I'll ask you to be very attentive. And I myself will have to be very careful because the issues we're talking about, they're sensitive for two reasons. A, they're sensitive because there's people struggling with these issues. There will be people in this hall struggling with these issues. And B, what I'll try to do is relay these issues to our Imams, our Prophets, our Ahlul Bayt. Now I'm not saying that our Imams and our Ahlul Bayt and the Prophets suffered from depression or anxiety. I'm not saying they suffered from isolation or any of these mental health issues. But the things they went through in life, the struggles they faced in life, how did they deal with those? How did they deal with the tragedies they went through? And if you want to say that the tragedies were not difficult for our Ahlul Bayt, for our Imams, then I'll tell you one thing today. This is a John Rada of Muharram. They say that in Medina, there was never ever a need for the people of Medina to look at the sky to know when the moon for Muharram had arrived. They never needed to look up at the sky, they would just know that the moon of Muharram had arrived. I would ask, how can you know? <coughs> Without looking towards the moon, how can you know that the moon is there? It is said that from the house of Sadiq al Muharram, Muhammad, the sound of crying would become so loud as soon as this moon came out into the sky that all those in Medina would understand Muharram has arrived. The month of Imam Hussein salam, is here. When I prepare my Masai, every night is generally associated with a Shaheed. Be it Hazrat Qasim, be it Hazrat Awana Muhammad, be it Hazrat Hur, be it Akbar or Asra, be it Mawla Hussain alayhi salam. Every night is generally associated with a Shaheed. And on that night, I recite Masai for that Shaheed. We cry for that Shaheed. But tonight, who do we cry for? Tonight, there is no Shaheed that we associate this night with. Who do we cry for today? Tonight we cry because Rasulullah is crying. Tonight our tears are because Ali and Murtaza is crying, because Hassan and Mujtaba is crying. Tonight we cry because <coughs> Ali Zayn al Abideen is crying. We cry because Muhammad Ibadir is crying. We cry because Jafar Sadiq is crying. Tonight when we shed our tears and we do our zadari, it's because Imam Musa Qazim is crying. When we cry and we wail and we weep, when our hearts start to feel sad, because Imam Ali and Raza is crying. Imam Muhammad al-Taqi is crying, Imam Ali al-Naqi is crying, Imam Hassan al-Askari is crying. Our Mawla, our Master, Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi tonight is crying. And tonight amongst all of those names, the most Sayyid of Zahra is crying. When we look out across the world, when we look in Najaf, we see a great majlis for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We see the Zadari of Imam Hussein alayhi salam happening. Thousands of people gather. Look to Karbala, you'll see thousands of people there. Thousands of people gathered. Look to Samara, look to Qadmain, you'll see thousands of people. Go to Iran. In Mashhad, you'll see people crying for Imam Hussein. In Qum, you'll see people crying for Imam Hussein. I studied in an international university in Iran. Over there, I was so surprised when I saw where the people come from, where, where the places in the world where Azadari of Imam Hussein takes place. Go to Tokyo, you will see Azadari of Imam Hussein. Go to Beijing, you will see Azadari of Imam Hussein. Go to Bangkok in Thailand, you will see Azadari of Imam Hussein. Go to the villages of Africa, you will see people cry for Imam Hussein. Come here to Salau, you will see a Zadari of Imam Hussein. Go a little further up the road to Reading, you will see a Zadari of Imam Hussein. Go into London, you will see tens of places where there are majalis of Imam Hussein. But take just one look at Jannah al <coughs> See who is crying for Mawla Hussein there. See where the Zadari and the Majlis is at Jannah al There is a story of an old lady her and her son, every year, they would hold an ashra for the first 10 days of Muharram. People would come from far and wide, they would take part in the majalis of Mawla Hussein. 
just a few words and then we'll go upstairs, inshallah, take part in the Messiah and the martyrdom of the Mount saying upstairs. This woman every year with her son would take part in the Majalis. She'd hold a Majlis at her house, the Ashra of Majalis, 10 days. People would come from far and wide to the Majlis. There were not a lot of Majalis in those days. It just so happened one year that her son passed away. After that, the woman was alone and unable to, to hold these Majalis. She was unable to organize the Majalis in her house. She had no one to help her. She went to her son's grave and she cried and she said to him, look, this year I cannot do Majlis, I'm alone. She then goes back to her house. She raises her hands in dua and she calls out, oh Allah, bear witness that I would have held Majalis this year. I would have had the Majalis this year just like every year, but I'm alone, I have no one to help me and I cannot hold these Majalis this year. She had just finished saying this, calling out to Allah when she heard a knock at her door. She went to open the door and she sees a lady there who says to her, I've been told from the people of the town that you normally hold majalis. The woman says, I normally hold majalis, but this year I will not be able to because I have nobody to help me. I used to with my son and he has passed away. The woman at the door looks at her and says, this year, hold the majalis, I will help you. I will stay with you and help you to take care of the majalis. So the two women together, they organized the majlis for Imam Hussain for 10 days. And every day, the woman who owns the house, the woman who did the majlis every year, she watches her guest. This guest every day before the guests come, stands at the door, greets the women and the children and thanks them for coming to the majlis as if it was a majlis of her own. Before they leave, she stands at the door. She bids farewell to them. She takes care of them as though it was her own majlis. This happened every single day. And then on the 9th of Muharram, the woman lays out the carpets for the majalis. She says salam to all the guests as they come. She bids them farewell as they leave and then she turns to the woman who owns the house. Who owns the house. And she says to her, now I must leave, I must go on my travels. The owner of the house says, but tomorrow is Ashura. Tomorrow is the 10th of Muharram, how can you leave today? The woman says, no, I must travel very far. I, if, I, if I do not leave now, I will not make it. The woman tries and tries to convince her guests to stay, but her guests will not stay. Finally, she lets the woman go. She thanks her for her help. Her guest goes off on her travels. The 10th Muharram comes and goes. The majalis happens. The people come and they leave. On the 11th of Muharram, that woman goes to the grave of her son. She wants to go and tell her son about everything that has happened. She wants to go and tell her son about this woman who came and how she helped her, how the majalis took place despite her being alone. But as she approaches the grave, she sees a woman lying over the grave of her son crying. She comes forward to the woman and she says to her, maybe you've been mistaken. This is the grave of my son. Maybe your son, the grave of your son is somewhere else. Maybe the grave of the person you are crying over is somewhere else, but this is my son's grave. And there is nobody else who comes to my son's grave. The woman over the grave turns around and she looks at the old woman. She looks at her and says, for 10 days you cried over my son. Today let Zahra cry over your son. Just remember today. Just remember if we cry over the son of Sayyidah Zahra, it is not in vain. If we are sitting here, it is not because we wanted to sit here. It is not because our parents forced us to sit here, no. It is because we were chosen by Sayyidah Zahra to come here to be amongst those who feel sad for Mawla Hussein, to be amongst those who shed tears over Mawla Hussein. If we are here today, it is because we are amongst those chosen to come here, to sit here, to learn. We are amongst those who have been specifically chosen to learn about Imam Hussein, to cry over him, and to take benefit from these majalis azam. Allah la'natullahi ala khamis zalameen. Sayyallamu al-ladheen adhan mu'ayyamu qalabin yanqalibun. I believe now, if everybody takes place, takes their, makes their way upstairs, the Messiah upstairs will continue, and inshallah, they'll come out in the